I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. Lisa in the Adirondacks, New York, is joining us today. She's giving us an update on some new things she's found. Tom, you want to give us an announcement first? Yeah, absolutely. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. This is going to be a great show. You don't want to miss it. Lisa has, she always brings some amazing stuff to the table. And as always, if you like the show, let us know. It really helps us out. Click the like and subscribe. And if you want to support us, you can do so in YouTube. We have a link to Patreon. And I personally, I just want to thank everybody who is uh, sending uh, well wishings to me. So thank you very much, folks. And with that said, I'm going to hand it off to Lisa. Hi there. <laughs> Good to be back. Lisa, you sent you sent us a whole bunch of pictures, and I forwarded them. We have, uh, of course, uh, Chuck and Forrest and TW with us, besides Tom and myself. And I sent, I forwarded those to everyone that's on the panel here today. Um, oh, good. T- tell us what's going on there. Okay. Well, um, last time I was on, um, I had just moved up to the Adirondacks here, and. Um, Went out, I'll just be brief, went out searching for an area to start um, looking for another group since I moved up from the Northern Catskills. Found a group, <clears throat> recorded them all fall, um, got some really good stuff. Um, very much like down in the Catskills, they were in an, uh, a large area surrounded on all sides by roads. I first went off um to find the most wild area I could and put my recorders out. And it was kind of hit or miss. Um, I did uh, get some good recordings, but with such a large area, it was just just too much. So um, I decided to try um, to find them in the same type of area I did down in the Catskills. And lo and behold, I found a group same same mo um i put out the recorder and a juvenile would sit literally sit by it or do whatever he was doing all night long i could hear the rest of the group in the distance roaring a lot of roaring going on and um if they weren't so far away i'm sure um i would have heard some perhaps talking or other noises but they were just too far off so my plan this year as I told you, was to find um, uh, the density of their population. That that has always been something that uh, was very curious to me because when I was in the Catskills, there was a young guy I knew that got into this, and he's got a YouTube channel, a Facebook um, channel on the Catskills, and he claimed that he knew of six or seven groups in the area. I researched my one group, and that there was something like 40 individuals like in all these groups. And it was maybe 10, uh, let's imagine a square 10 miles by 10 miles all the way around. So that just didn't seem feasible to me, especially with uh, the area I was in, the very northern Catskills is um, a lot of cliffs, very steep, um, rocky, um, not as many deer as you would find right across the river where Gale is, a lot of farmland over there. So it it just did not add up to me. And, and I told him my opinion, and it was just my opinion. Um, I don't know. Um, so my plan this year was to find um, several other areas that fit the um, MO of the area I recorded in last year within a 15-mile radius. And um, I amassed quite a few recorders now, and um, I was going to find at least three other areas um, 
and put out recorders all at the same time, same night, you know, same day and night. And until I could narrow down and find um, other groups um, and see how close they were to each other. Um, as of yet, um, I'm not able to determine how many members are in the group I'm currently researching. Um, I know of three at least, um, just by the tracks I've been able to amass. Um, and uh, I went out there, oh, I think in March. We we had a really mild winter. We had very little snow until the end of March. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, just prior to the snow, I went out there with my dog and um, found what looked like some melted out tracks um, on the edges of a swamp. And my dog is very, um, she's very frightened of them. If she smells them, if they've been in the area recently, she, she's very, very nervous. Normally, she just takes off and loves to run and run through the woods. Um, but if they're anywhere around, she wants out. <clears throat> so she was, she kept alerting to this one area where we heard sticks breaking. And it was too far off to see anything, so I happened to have a camera on me, um, and I was set on 34 zoom, and I just started snapping pictures to see what I would come up with. Um, did you get a chance to look at uh, the pictures that weren't prints that may or may not have been? I, I'm a real blob squatch hater. <laughs> I, I did, and I, I forwarded them to everyone on the panel. I don't know if everybody got a chance to look at them. Has anyone taken a look at those? It's the first time I've snapped what I thought might be a Bigfoot. Tom, I, Lisa, I did. Yeah, I uh, I did a um, I go through, and, and sometimes I just do a quick uh, kind of a cherry picking through the uh, pictures, but they're very, very good. And I got to say, I was telling Will this just before he got on, we always get good stuff from Lisa. And um, I, I do have a question for you. How many groups do you think are in your area? Because that's interesting that you're finding multiple groups. That's pretty cool. And typical. Well, yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, did you see the tracks that were in the mud? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Those tracks um, I found over the summer. Um, they are up at a reservoir, probably, oh, 10 miles from my group. And okay. it's, it's off limits. Most of the land is all posted around there. I'll try not to be too specific. <laughs> Give yeah, yeah, yeah. Trouble. Is it, is it but, uh, a reservoir run by somebody other yes. than the state? Or, okay. All right. Gotcha. We won't yes. get into it's a, wa it's, okay. a, it's a watershed. Okay. I went north of it. Um, once you get past the posted signs, um, it, it's a dirt road that's only maintained uh, in the summertime. Um, uh, once you get past the reservoir, which you can't see from the road, um, you come across uh, private deer camps. I shouldn't say deer camps. Most of them are, but any kind of bungalow or, or hunting camp, everything is called okay. a camp up here. And nobody's in them until the fall. These ones in the woods, they're, they're strictly hunting camps. And a lot of them are not posted because as a rule, um, the way the Adirondack Park is set up, it's not one huge park um, with nothing else in it. It's all broken up areas. And there's a really neat YouTube video called the Adirondacks. Um, it's a documentary done by the BBC. Oh, they always uh, do good stuff. And uh, yeah, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. It's two hours long, and it tells about the whole entire history of the park and logging and and everything else. Um, and it was basically a experiment to have people living within the park. Like there's wild land and then there's a small town you know there's separate park areas it's not just one big open park and um nothing in the park can be cut taken it's forever wild okay gotcha so it's a designated wildland okay yeah, yeah we so got those here. um anyway i came i came down from the north 
and where it's unposted, a lot of people don't post their property because a lot of snowmobiling trails run through private property when permission is given, as long as it's not abused. So um, I came down through unposted property and I did hit the reservoir and um, I found those tracks in the mud. And, those are um, good tracks. You did a, uh, I just, I'm jumping in real quick. I just want to say you did a superb job of documenting. Well, thank that. you. Photo yeah, yes. you know, I, I never expected to see anything. I was just checking the area out. And um, so I didn't have any measurements on me. So I put something next to them and gave the measurement. And I yeah. think they work out to, uh, they're under 14 inches. I, I think I came up with 12 if I used. Uh, but the dimensions know, are very, there. definitely not human. Oh, they no. Only, they only superficially resemble human footprints um sorry i keep jumping in but because it's your stuff is no that's that's fine (laughs) so then the 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 detailed ones where i did a lot of writing yeah on the photographs explaining them that is a wilderness area within the park that's about a half hour drive from here um i don't know the mileage but i went up there to um do some snowshoeing after we finally got some snow and um it was very obvious i was the first and only one in there it's not a uh it's it's park uh it's part of the adirondack park but it's not a specific trailhead um there are a couple primitive camps for deer hunters each having a little um uh what do you call it outhouse next to it there's maybe four or five you'll see in there But other than that, it's not a designated trailhead. People don't go in there hiking. So it was clear I had been the only one in there. And I came across those two sets of prints, the larger and then definitely the juvenile print. Yeah. I've got a question um, on those because of two things. Um, This is one I'm gonna throw out to Will and Forrest. Uh, This isn't a Q and A time, but it's just something that kind of piqued my interest the size of the footprints and your location makes me wonder and so i just wonder this question in my head is it possible that this this could be a group of type fours and um i'll start with you will what what are your thoughts on the possibility that she's dealing with perhaps some type fours up there which are more we don't know if they're uh, kind of a caveman, you know, Neanderthal, or I don't know. I'm just throwing it your way to see what your thoughts are, and, and then for us too. Well, it's certainly always a possibility. Yeah, I know. That, I know. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to quickly add. Um, I noticed the difference in the shape of them, but yeah. um, that never occurred to me. It, you that was you got some interesting call. stuff to say the least. <laughs> yeah, it's especially that part of the country. It's you know because that's where they seem to be situated, that particular variant. But um, you know, from the footprints, we don't really have enough information to differentiate between right. you know that variant and the other ones yet. So, but it is certainly possible because we have a lot of reports. Yeah, from they that weren't. Region. Those weren't fresh. Yeah, they had been snowed over. Yeah, Forrest, what do you think? Yeah, well, I'm I'm perfectly uh, available in my mind to uh, believe that anything's possible these days. Um, I, You know, we're talking about the more uh, caveman-like uh, Neanderthal uh, possible uh, beings that, uh, is that what we're referring to on the type fours? Yes. Yes, okay. And and I've been looking through this, this stuff that you sent me, Will, and I can't find the uh, the 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 footprints am i supposed to be seeing footprints here or am i just uh missing that but i'm I, yeah i'm open to uh any such uh thought that those might exist in that area and that seemed to wasn't the i'm trying to remember the ice man wasn't that what was was that minnesota uh yeah it was minnesota yeah that was so, minnesota um, yeah the minnesota yeah. ice man yeah but it's still so, all that same um, region well, I know, and I've been all through uh, the Adirondacks up there in New York. So um, I, I used to think, geez, uh, what a lovely way to, 
to leave New York and and be in such a beautiful area. It's like everybody everybody lives in New York, thank God, and and then you've got all this beautiful <laughs> pristine uh, forest land out here. So um, it, it was a, a rather pleasant experience <laughs> getting out of New York. So um, yeah, it's surprising anyway, how but, much uh, water. Yeah, I'm, and I'm open are. to that being a possibility. I mean, uh, yes, 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 yes. You know, just to throw some perspective into the state of New York, uh, you know, a lot of people, myself included, at one point, you, you think of, uh, you know, you think of New York City and Wall Street and all that. But actually, the state of New York is huge, and it the um, the entire circumference of New York is actually greater than that of England. So uh, it's a it's a big chunk of land, and uh, the upstate New York is. Fantastic. Um, Even the Catskills. Are, there's yeah. tons of wilderness where I lived in the northern uh, Catskills that, that nobody went through. There, there no, there's no trails. There's maybe one. It's called the Long Path um, that goes through. But other than that, you have tons of mountains, you know, over 3,500 feet up to 4,000 feet. Um, there's no trails oh, yeah. on them. They're all wooded. They're all steep. Nobody goes They're up huge. them. Well, you have. Everyone looks uh, at them, but people just don't go there. Well, don't you have a like a pretty good combination of uh, deciduous and conifers, as far as the natural down trees in the are? Catskills? Yes. Okay. Um, with the um, Adirondacks, there's much more coniferous. It's it's um, the, the further south you go, the more deciduous trees you have. You don't have the um, number of oak trees that you do down in the Catskills. There's tons of oak trees with acorns. Um, a friend of mine who has a hunting camp that I visited up on the on the Tug Hill Plateau um, uh, tried to grow some oak trees up there and they wouldn't even grow. Really? I couldn't even get them to grow. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you talk about the acorns. I mean, that's, uh, that's the beginning of a pretty good food chain for the little animals all the way up to the, uh, the big ones. Absolutely. The deer and the Bigfoot. Yes. I remember yes. putting out that, finding those uh, acorns that look like they had been opened like pistachio nuts, like using two nails and popping open right. two halves. Deer don't and do that. Uh, I found a pot. Right. I found a pot. I don't know. At least you're New York deer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey Lisa, I got another. Yeah, well, that's that's cool. And if you got some pictures, they'll send those along. I'd love to see those. I think I saw them last. Oh, time, I thought I sent those to you. I, I'll send you did. Them again. Yeah, you did. I got a good memory, but it's short and a huge inbox. <laughs> but I got a question for you. Last time you and I talked, a weird situation came up, and it's actually a repeating pattern. And what it is is. Um, you had moved to a new area that was kind of like a real small village. And one of these creatures, if I'm wrong, I believe it would run on the perimeter of the village barking like a dog, and it would instigate dogs. And basically it, the, the point of it was for one of the owners to let their dog out. And that yes. would always be a mistake for the dog. Could you, for the listeners yes. who haven't heard that and those that want a refresher like me, can you give us a brief sure. overview of what happened there? Because that yep. says a lot about I had just started recording um, down in the Catskills, and um, the, the juvenile would be right there. Um, occasionally, I would leave apples out in a separate area, and I could he actually hear him eating them, urinating. And you'd hear the odd mouse scurrying around, and you could hear him running after and chasing it. Well, one night... He got a hold of something larger than a mouse, smaller than a raccoon. I don't know what, but it was screeching and, and hollering, and I timed it. It took him four minutes to dispatch it before it was quiet. And I think because of that, he interrupted um, the main group's hunt because there was a sound, you know, people say that wood knocks or tongue pops, whatever they are. This is like a rifle shot. Her and nose. you could hear the alpha, I'm, I'm assuming it was the alpha, did this huge pterodactyl scream. And I could hear him stomping through the woods immediately after this. It sounded like he was infuriated. And the road I was taping on 
the recorder was almost dead in the middle of it and it's a long hill and the woods on the left as you're going up houses interspersed on the right a group at the bottom a couple more towards the middle and then two at the very top well he proceeded to go start at the bottom and this was 2 30 in the morning now and he started at the group of houses at the bottom and he started big barking like a dog and you could tell it wasn't a dog because after he did it a few times you know like like the like the owl you know sometimes it's just not an owl so it would start i could hear literally hear the dogs in the houses barking incessantly at this and um i didn't catch on at first and he did it for oh a good 20 minutes and uh, they didn't let the dogs out. They must have quieted them. Went up further to the next house, did the same thing. And I could again hear the dogs barking in the house and he was fake barking and to no avail. He continues up the road doing this, stopping at each of the houses and he gets to the last house and he's barking and I can hear two different dogs barking. They had very distinct barks and the owners threw them outside and I could hear it was like he was trying with them trying to to gain their interest to come into the woods and you could tell by their barks they were very hesitant they knew something was wrong but one dog eventually went into the woods and I immediately heard a scream and then nothing yeah and the other dog there was a dog screaming eventually Heard, yeah, he heard the dog screaming, and he eventually went in and was killed too. Yeah. Um, is what I'm assuming because they both, I could hear them go into the woods. I could hear him trying to entice them, and you know, I could clearly hear um, them being let out of the house. Their barking they, immediately became louder. They were outside, and uh, eventually, one went in. The first one went in, and. Uh, I heard a, a yelp and a scream and then nothing. I think he just grabbed it and broke its neck or something. You know, I'm you think about it. Well, assumptions here, but you know. Well, yeah. That, that's, that's what well, I got. There. Yeah. Um, so, what does this say about the cunning, deceptive nature of these things to do something like that? And by the way, when you talk about the little animal where it took about four minutes yeah. to dispatch that. Well, I, I, think, I think they're more than just a normal animal. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, well, like they say, if they were just an ape, the, the Native Americans would have their teeth around their neck going back hundreds of years or thousands of years. You yeah. know. And they, I, all, they all have names for them and they all call them people. So. Yeah. Well, uh, and I'm certainly applied to the type fours. Um, and you, you talk about the one where it took four minutes to dispatch, like we didn't know if it was a raccoon or whatever. But I've heard that. I was out, and I don't want to talk about me, but I just want to uh, kind of reaffirm Nothing. the repeating pattern here, and that is we've had that from other credible witnesses, and I heard that one night when we were, uh, the first time I had a sighting, and it climbed up a tree, and it spent, I, I recorded it in a, in a report, it took about two to three minutes to finish dispatching a bird. Like, why couldn't you just take care of it right away? No, it was, uh, it was almost like it was getting a thrill kill by doing this. And wasn't there a story someone told where um, a Sasquatch was running in an open area after a herd of deer and grabbed the first one, broke its front legs, and then left yes. it and went on to, to kill another one? That was in he Texas. Just, uh, immo yeah, that immobilized was... it and uh, just kept on. Right. After he, more. he broke its legs and went after the other ones. And we think it was probably to immobilize it so that he would have one and then he could get another one. It was, uh, Will, you probably remember that. That was a 15 year old kid, I think, in Texas. Oh, yeah. Who was fishing in his own backyard. I mean, it was, what do you say, 100 yards or so from the house. Not that far, maybe 150 yards. And he saw that. 
And I think he decided to cut his fishing trip very short. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Lee had the Speaking same thing. These... Pardon me? No, well, we had a gentleman on uh, on the old Witness of the Unknown days and named Lee, and he had this uh, in his backyard I think a couple times, and it finally killed this little doe. So uh, there's been several instances where they seem to do these thrill kills and it's it's uh, pointless from yeah standpoint you don't do yeah that. it makes you wonder you know what's what's the thinking behind it is it that they have a huge group that they need to feed or is it just the thrill of the kill is it what is it i think it's the latter i think we should ask your forest yeah. input on that you know compared to yes. other primates yeah, like chimpanzees. Uh, they're vicious hunters. Well, I, that's what I was just going to bring up. Uh, chimpanzees, my late, the least favorite uh, of the great apes. Um, and Mine the guys as well. My, <laughs> and uh, they are, and we're talking about pantroglodytes. We're not. I don't really know that much about the uh, the belly apes, but they say that they're. They call them the lion hunters. So. Uh, Lion killers, uh, so I guess that kind the of tells you a lot about them. Uh, no, 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 I didn't say bonobos, I said the billy apes. Uh, the bonobos, okay. I, I've said over and over in here on this show, the bonobos are, are, are anything but vicious, they solve everything by sex. So, with sex, uh, they're, they're, they they're sex, quite right. a happy group. Sex uh, keeps yep. them happy, happy, happy all the time. Yeah, uh, if you they know, have maybe the dispute, they settle it with sex. Yeah. Yep, uh, pan troglodytes should probably try that out, and so should the billy apes. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, chimpanzees are vicious. Are they are vicious. extremely vicious, and uh, there's <laughs> uh, nothing particular that I care for them, but uh, uh, I received a vicious bite back when I was studying them. Well, and uh, school, I feel the so same I way. Like, after... okay, I want to. I want to. I think I like the macaques better over here. Can I go study them? <laughs> so, I don't blame anyway. you. Anyway, uh, anyway, no, that sounds like. Uh, and I and I've said this over and over, and the guys can verify this. But I I find that uh, Bigfoot. Uh, seems to, in their behavior patterns, remind me way too much of chimpanzees. So, yeah. it was my particular, that, my particular feeling, yeah, my particular feelings are is that I think that they are a bipedal grade eight, but, you know, uh, and there people, other people have different opinions and, and they're all valid. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't uh, fault anybody for thinking otherwise, uh, but uh, I, they remind me way too much of chimpanzees. Way yeah. too much. You know, that that just uh, reminded me quick of something um, kind of on topic, kind of off, um, having to do with Melba Ketchum and her DNA study. Um, it's not about her what she did. Um, it's She has a GoFundMe page now to do um, testing on um, Dogman, Bigfoot, um, and I don't know if it's in the Texas area or where it is, but you, you can find it. Um, I, it was on a link on a YouTube video I saw. So I went to the page and uh, well, she her has is a 20. Texas. Yeah, so maybe I don't know. You know, she wasn't soliciting samples. It was to fund DNA She's trying to make a buck. Study. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know the woman, so I don't know anything about her. But, well, the um, only, only conversations I've ever had with the woman was on uh, in regards to horses and color patterns and paint. So uh, she was very congenial and very nice when we discussed that, but uh, I have never had any discussions with her as regarding to uh, Bigfoot. So, Well, she's a vet as well, correct? No, she's not a vet, but she, uh, not as far as I know. Oh, I she's thought she a, was a vet. Yeah, well, she, 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 may, she, she very, was, yes. She Was she a vet? Okay, well, then I, I stand corrected on that. I was not aware that she was a vet, but I do know that she is uh, a DNA specialist in animals. So uh, that was the reason that I had actually contacted her was in regards to uh, 
uh, I raised tame horses, and uh, they, you know, expressed certain patterns and stuff. So I was actually uh, talking to her in regards to that. Interesting. And this was this was actually before I knew she had anything to do with big food. So uh, I've never talked to her since about that. Uh, I've got a. I've got so a getting back for to you the caveman. Quick. Go ahead, Chuck. I, I was just curious. Um, I heard you talk about the dog, and and it uh, one of them mimicked the dog or tried to mimic like the dog. And have you ever heard them mimic other animals such as, um, and, and the reason I bring this up is because I, I heard a 800 pound rooster one time and, and there was no farm anywhere around. And, I, and I'm just wondering, have you, have you ever heard anything like that or, or have, have you heard them mimic like owls and stuff like that as well? Yes, to both, sort of. I've heard the owl all the time. In fact, I could kick myself because um, I had gotten a new laptop, um, which I'm not using. I had to get. I actually got a Mac. Um, one of my first recordings up here, I had uh, the juvenile scream an owl call into the recorder, and it began sounding like a man imitating an owl, a 600-pound man. Um, then it went into a pretty good imitation, but it messed up the growl of the barred owl at the end. So it was obviously the juvenile that did it. It wasn't a real one. And I've, I've heard it many times. When I lived in the Catskills, we had a lot of barred owls. In fact, we would do this little thing at night. We'd go out behind the house and see who could call one in the closest. And we actually called in a pair that flew right over our heads. But um, at one certain time of the year, in the fall, you would get the 600-pound owls that you knew weren't owls. And I do have on my recording, um, when the, I think it was the female and another offspring it wasn't the alpha, I don't believe, in my cat skill group would return to the juvenile. They would start this cackle call. Mm-hmm. And one guy argued up and down with me that it was a um, tree frog, an eastern gray tree frog. And we call them spring peepers here. And, you know, I, I camp out all the time. I camp out alone. Um, it was anything but. It was a weird, um, I can send the recording, I do have it, um, this cackling sound that I don't know what they were imitating, but it it was obviously some sort of animal sound, and they both did it, and you could hear them as they got closer and closer, and they finally returned to the juvenile and the recorder in the morning when daylight came. And, you know, I've I've heard them tried to mimic barred owls as well and it's funny sometimes because they'll start out and it sounds pretty close to a barred owl and then at the very end it sounds like you're listening to a mad chimpanzee and yeah, uh, yes yes i've heard that and, and that's that's a crazy sound to hear and you know we've, we've got <laughs> sure is. barred owls all over oklahoma and um you know, I have a team that, that go out with me and one night we went out to this one place in Northwest Oklahoma. And, uh, I bet you we heard probably what sounded like seven or eight barred owls all around us. And if, if you know anything about barred owls, barred owls do not congregate like that at all. No, just as a pair. Yeah. Yeah. They're solitary or paired up. Well, the recording that I I sent this morning to Will, I I knew it probably was too late to send it, is of, um, it was a tree with a a broken um, limb uh, leaning against it at a 45 degree angle. 
and I had my recorder on, oh, about an eight, eight and a half inch string just dangling from it. Um, it could reach the tree if it swung. And it's a very, very clear audio of bipedal walking up to it and then going a- walking around it through the dead leaves. There's a, you know, when it's dry in the east here, we have a lot of leaf litter. So it's very loud. And walking around it, sniffing it, you can, you know, it's audible. You can hear it sniffing it. And um, it doesn't real. it's almost like it didn't realize it made a chimp sound, like a, like a, um, I can't do it, but sounded like a baby chimp, chimpanzee. And then it proceeded, I believe it must have used a stick. I don't think it would have used its hand to touch, you know, some kind of human uh, thing. Um, but it began to bang the recorder, whacking it back and forth with a stick so that it was banging against the tree very loudly. It was just whacking it around. Um, then it got up and walked around again, sniffed it again, banged it back and forth again, and then clearly bipedally walks off. Um, so Lisa, I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Send it. Absolutely send it. And the reason I asked oh, I did. is. I okay. did it. I sent it through uh, through Facebook chat to Will. Can you send uh, it by email? It, it, yeah, send it by email if you could. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, um, it's a six minute clip. Really, the three, the first three and a half minutes are are all the action. Send it to questions. Plural. Oh, questions hang on. Creek. All right. I'm going questions to put you to work. Plural? Questions <laughs> at creekdevil.com. Okay. And the reason I ask is I have a similar recording. We were in a situation, uh, a buddy of mine, he's been on the show, Kurt. And we stuck a recorder out in the Willamette National Forest. And we were in a place where we knew they weren't. We heard some of them screaming about a mile away, but in our exact location, they weren't there, except they were as probably 50 yards away at the most, 25 yards. And when we drove off, it recorded the recording had our truck driving off. And then you heard bipedal footsteps and it walked right up to that. Yeah, recorder that I put on the tree, and we got some kind of a warning call from a bird. So even the birds know what these things are. So it's oh I, yeah, I love these uh, kind of reaffirming, repeating patterns. One on the west well, coast, you know one on the east coast. Yeah, on every one of my recordings that I put out in my new area. Um, I only put it back, I don't know, 150, I'm, I'm terrible with measurements, 150 to 200 yards in. And maybe it takes me 30 seconds to walk out after I turn it on. So you can hear me walking out and then nothing for a second. But within one minute, the one minute mark, that juvenile is at that recorder without no. fail on every one no. of my recordings. Isn't that interesting? So you're under observation. Will and weird. I've got maybe 15 recordings because I got a late start, you know, up here. Yeah, but you know, you're in an area where they're not. Will have we ever talked about that? Oh, just us? once or twice. Yeah, they're not around, <laughs> and by golly, they sure are. So uh, they're, oh, they're yeah. very stealthy. Yeah, it was yeah, kind we- of. Um, a little dissettling when um, more than uh, I realized that 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 the juvenile was right there. Right. Well, that's there, funny. Moment. That is funny After because the one that we recorded, it was a juvenile. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I I've never seen it. I can't swear to it, but I believe the recordings from down in the Catskills that group and this group. I believe it's it's always the juvenile at the recorder in both cases. I think next time we're going to leave them a slice of pizza. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, you know, getting back to that caveman type, the Neanderthal type. Yeah. I have a very dear friend in the panhandle of Florida that had the most frightening. He literally had PTSD afterwards. 
Um, you should, you really should have him on. He, he's been on someone else's show, but um, well, let's get him on. Breakdown. Yeah, um, he was checking a hog trap, and it was at night, and they have to be checked um, every so many days by law, and nobody could get out there. So he had to do it. And he was with his ex-girlfriend at the time. And he had parked next to a small um, peanut field um, of a farmer. And then through the woods, there was a just a sand track just with the tracks for the guy's tractor to go to his big field. And on either side was a wall of pine trees and vines, almost impenetrable. And by moonlight, if you're at one end, you could see the field at the other end. So he went and he uh, checked the trap. Nothing was in it. And he was on his way back. And he had heard something um, pacing him coming through the woods. And he really didn't even know about Bigfoot. And he's, his brother-in-law was a game warden of some type and told him about bears. So he had this impression in his head that a bear smells um, terrible and everything he told him lined up with what he was smelling and hearing. So he thought it was a bear and he's getting scared because, you know, he never came across a bear, didn't know anything about a bear. And this thing was angling towards him as he's going back to the track and he can just make out the chrome on the car. The car is running because it's very hot. She had the air conditioner on. Um, All of a sudden, this thing comes out, and it's behind him. And he hears what... I I don't want to give away too many details, because if you have him on the show... um, But in any event, I'll just give you the synopsis. Um, He turns around, and all he sees is black. He can't see the peanut field that he should be looking at. It was that close to him. And he had neck and back surgery and he has plates and screws. So he cannot turn his head to the side and he cannot um, lower his head backwards to look up. It's very difficult for him to do. And as he started trying to look up, he realizes he's looking at hair, black hair. And he sees what he thinks is a Neanderthal. He thinks it's a, a caveman. And um, he was just frozen with fear. And he did something very smart. He had a headlamp on. And you know how they um, you hit the button and it goes through the cycles of the different colors? It goes maybe white, red, blue. Yeah, you got it. Um, it. He ended up signaling this woman by flashing his uh, headlamp. But um, the story is just horrifically scary, the details of what happened to him that night. So um, I'll give him a call. Um, yeah, please I'll do. Send, uh, I'll, I'll, I don't want to say his name on air, you know. Oh, I um, but I, uh, you know, without his permission. So um, I'll send the details to you guys and uh i'll contact him and uh i'll give you my yeah, first when we get off it, the show it, lisa i'll give you my personal email me? address well when we get off the show okay. i'm going to give you my personal contact information and okay uh, he great can reach out to me or i'll reach out to him would love to do that wonderful, wonderful. yeah he's fascinating really fascinating and scary well, uh, those type horrifying fours, scary. yeah, well, those Neanderthal types, I are just very fascinated by them because they are yeah. kind of in a group all their own. Yeah. He and his wife um, run an animal sanctuary, and they're both disabled. And um, so they they hunt for to put meat on their table, basically. And he he couldn't go out for like two years. Ooh. It was it was so terrifying. And he yeah, had subsequent sightings after that too. Oh so, really? Um, yep, yeah, yeah. Daytime sightings. Yeah. 
but that would be interesting. You know, I never thought about that up here. I always thought it was just the, the type one, but um, the tracks are definitely different as you pointed out. Well, I'm, I think, I'm wondering, if, you know, what, what I'm finding kind of fascinating is that we're, we're talking about the type fours and, you know, and I, I even referred to them as a Neanderthal type. Um, the thing that, uh, I don't think they're quite, I don't think they're quite Neanderthal. I could be wrong, but I don't think they're quite Neanderthal because, you know, we've got Neanderthals that had a very, uh, well-developed social structure plus, uh, they yeah. wore clothing and, uh, they also had tool use and, uh, have no, have been known to, uh, you know, paint and decorate their caves. Uh, and we don't see that in right. the, these type of, uh, you know, uh, I, and I hesitate to call them creatures because I think these are, I think these are, sep- I think what we're probably looking at, maybe, this is my idea, guys, just my, my, my theory, and y'all, y'all take it for what it's worth. I think we may be looking at a, uh, another type of archaic um, hominid. That Possibly? that's been my thought too. With it, it's not. I, I mean, we use. I agree. We kind of we kind of talk thought. about you know Neanderthal is sort of a just a reference point for people when we're talking about. Yeah, this. I, I don't mean it. I don't use it literally that they're Neanderthals. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, just no, from no, people's I, I description of them. So, that's all. Know, yeah, yeah, I used it too. Uh, uh, so uh, it's. You know, You're I, I'm guilty company. of having said it as well, but I mean that's the closest <laughs> thing that we can relate it to. I don't think that they're really no. like Bigfoot, no, Bigfoot. No, but, uh, but they are. I think what we're probably looking at is some sort of archaic human. And oh my gosh, uh, well, I guess we shouldn't refer to them as hominids. We need to refer them to just as hominids. <laughs> Hominin. Sure. Hominin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we better we better keep it correct. We, we must the, be the anthropologically correct. <laughs> yeah, that's oh right. God. Isn't that an oxymoron? Know, there's, a of, <laughs> well. there's a lot of old timers out there like me that probably are just shaking their heads, going, "Yeah, right." That's okay. right. So, for anybody who wants to write comments that are going to gripe, you know, we're, we have the disclaimer there, folks. <laughs> These are just opinions, uh, right? So, if you complain, of course, I'm with you a thousand percent. If, if you, mean, you can, if you complain, hominid. if you complain in writing, I'm going to delete your comment. So. That's so you know that up front. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. But the whole hominid, hominid thing, I just, I, I still default to hominid. Boom. There you go. Well, you know, yeah. and I do too. So, I mean, the hominid, this, the, the, you know, it, Tom and I had a lengthy discussion about it. It's like, you know, they're just trying to eliminate the great apes out of the hominin version, which, I mean, everybody knew that anyway, so why why are you doing that? They're all still lumped in the hominid a day uh, uh, species <laughs> and classification. So, I mean, uh, come on, guys. Come on, really. Uh, it, you know, it's kind of like Tom said. Somebody just wanted to get their name in on the, the, the deal. So, uh, and, and, you know, what can I say? Um, but, yeah, I think that what we probably are looking at is some sort of archaic human that has possibly lived all this uh you know time and immoral and uh, ex- <laughs> managed to eke out an existence uh and you know away from the rest of the homo sapiens sapiens yeah not everything out there that's you know a hairy human-like creature is a bigfoot well i was married to one 13 years. So I <laughs> <laughs> well, TW, it. tell us, man. Tell us, tell us your experience. <laughs> I, well, I was, I was married to a uh, homo Pentecostal, uh, and I slept with one eye open for 13 years because I was scared to death that she's going to dance around the bed naked, speaking in tongues, slinging a rattlesnake. So I can attest to that. <laughs> You know, that brings up a question of mine, regardless of the type. Here's here's a question for the group. Now, most times when someone sees a Bigfoot or creature or archaic human crossing the road, now obviously they can hear a car coming, correct? 
Yeah, I think oh, yeah. Time, I'm sure. Well, that goes okay. I'm laughing, guys. I'm laughing. So, <laughs> but for the most part, um, you hear the the saying that either they want you to see them, but for the most part, it's an oops. No, on their part. If I'll, I'll tell you, you know, if they want to stay hidden, they can stay hidden. Most of the time, right. if well, you see one, they want you to see them for a reason. Right. Now, the question is, if they do not want to be seen, whether you're in California or in New York, you will not see them. Right. Now, you equate that to modern humans trying to teach their child or children something like that. you got to take into the probability of... 100% across the board, every human being able to teach their child to do that and have them do it, what are the odds of that? How many people are good teachers? How many, you know, the variations are crazy. It could never be done. So I would say not among their humans ability these days. To do that hardwired? Is it hardwired? Forrest, what do you think? I mean, then, other primates are pretty good at teaching their offspring about dangers. Well, I also think it's trial and error a lot of times. Uh, and, you know, I agree with Will. If, if they want you to see them, you're going to see them. If they don't want to see them, you won't. Well, guys, so, let's face it. I think there's there are times that there are oops, and I think that one that we occurred that had occurred right here out here on my uh, farm to market road. That was a, I think that was an oops because it did not look at us. It actually turned its head away and, and it was, and I told you it was in a squatted down position and it turned its head away from the headlights. And I don't, I think that was one of those oops, uh, you know, occurrences. Oh yeah. I think there are oops. Occurrences. I, listened, I listened to that podcast and that's, and you retelling that. So but the fact that across the board they are that diligent can that be a taught thing across the board so I mean a hundred percent across the board be taught it, it almost well, is, you know, a lot of it statistically yeah. impossible you're asking a question that we have heard, I've had, I think all of us on the panel have had, is it seems like a contradiction of terms. On the one hand, they want to remain uh, concealed from us, want nothing to do with us, and yet at times, they walk across the road, and they'll do it in the evening when there's headlights. Hello, they, they know darn good while there's a car there. So Correct. why is there this kind of behavior? You know, I guess there's variations in behavior as well, well that's as, a secondary question to me why do they want to be seen at times yeah i'm I don't, specifically talking I don't, about if they do not want to be seen they will not be seen none of them well but, but my, my view How is they, i don't think go ahead tw what i'm going to interject i'm going to interject something in here uh maybe it's not that they want to be seen maybe it's just they don't care if they're seen mm, that's a good point yeah well that's yeah. That's that's one of the things I was going to get at for us is that uh, I think a lot of times when you see them crossing the road, they're so adamant to get to the other side. It's either a troops ahead of them or there's a food source that they're they're desperately trying to get to. And it's they don't care whether they get seen at that point or not. Uh, ATW. Yeah. Is there any chance that a chicken crossed the road just before they did? <laughs> you know, that's a good damn question. It may not be a chicken. That might would be answer chicken. the proverbial question. <laughs> Why did the chicken cross the road? The road. <laughs> it might be a chicken. <laughs> oh, heavens. Yeah. The other question <laughs> is that I remember when I first... Um, started talking with Will when I first got into the subject matter and sent him some photographs. Um, we had talked, just touched on them finding mates. Do you, and I have a kind of 
I guess a lot of people I heard said they oh they they all go and congregate at this one spot once a year. That's one thing I heard. What about the theory of them finding it in neighboring groups? I think that for for bio, uh, for for genome diversity and and survivability, uh, I think they, uh, for lack of a better term. They probably go off and, and, you know, hey, you look pretty good, and snatch that from another group and create their own. Right, group. because there's no. Right. They're, yeah, they don't think there's incest. They're, they're not going to go and congregate someplace. Otherwise, you know, everybody in the world would know that. Right. But well, also, also that was that was a theory part. held for a long time, not by me, but you know, in general, that was the, the consensus answer you would get. That was an incorrect theory. Forrest, what do you think? Yes. Well, I was just going to interject something here. Is I think uh, that they're going to react like most uh, great apes do. Uh, when the young males get to a certain age, they're going to be kicked out of the troop, which I think is probably the reason that very often we see, uh, you know, and people will say, oh, I saw a male, um, you know, versus a female. Um, the males... Those young males get kicked out, but Alpha doesn't want those guys around. And uh, and he, that makes sense. definite competition for uh, for him. So he's going to kick those uh, his his sons out. So they're going to go off. And on the same token, the daughters will just generally they don't have to be kicked out. They just they will leave. I mean, this is a typical primate thing. The, the females will go off and um, they'll go find a, a beta uh, male somewhere that's been kicked out of another troop. And most generally, they just start their own little group right there, the low, their own familial group. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes uh, there are times that the uh, other troops will allow them to uh, cohabit with them. But if that and and then the alpha males and a lot especially in chimpanzee society uh will form uh you know bonds with certain beta males now he if they get ideas about having breeding rights well then that's an entirely different situation there uh, he's going to run them off and uh, they mm -hmm. even allow sometimes some of the alpha males that have been dethroned to even remain with the group as long as they don't prohibit don't present a threat to the breeding rights of that alpha male, then they might be allowed to hang around. But uh, as a general rule, his sons are, are run off because uh, they, you don't, the animals seem to have a, I don't know what you would call it, a um, inherent uh, prim, uh, primordial sense about them, about incest. I mean, very rarely does it actually occur in the wild. So, well, um, you know, regardless of species, that I mean, whether you're talking about mustangs, uh, a pride of lions, uh, tigers, any, am I any pack type animal will run off, uh, you know, their their offspring that are male and viable for breeding, and in the, you know, like in okay. mustangs, you you'll always have a bachelor herd that is off yep. to the side and they never breed but then you always see those ones that, that they start streaming off going off and they start creating their own herds uh the well, same way with actually will come in a, a new stallion will come in and if a mare is pregnant with the previous stallion's foal he will actually kick that female until she aborts the the foal. He will kill the foal, whether it's um, in utero or afterwards. I was told. No, yeah, they've been known to rape them. They've been known to rape them in the wild. Yes, they do. The stallions that take yeah. over a band will rape the mares very, very frequently to cause them mm -hmm. to abort. So, mm -hmm. yes, yep. Well, listen, guys. This is uh, we're we're coming up on the uh, edge of the hour here, and uh, I'm going to do a quick round table. Um, we're running out of time, but I'm going to start off with uh, Forrest. You got any final comments or thoughts on today's show? 
Well, I'm t- I'm totally in, uh, enthralled about this uh, caveman uh, and uh, possibility of a being in northern New York there or northwest New York. So uh, I'd like to certainly keep in touch with you uh, in regards Absolutely. to that. So. That's, I find very interesting. I'm downloading all your pictures right now, so I really can't make too many comments about those yet until I could get a, a, a chance to look at them. Forrest, I, <laughs> I sent your contact info to Lisa so you guys can be in touch if that's okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. And vice versa, feel free to give my contact information, please. Okay. Awesome. All right, Chuck, how about you? Any final comments or thoughts? Uh, great show and, and, uh, Great answers. Yep, I agree. TW, how about you, sir? No. Nope. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, listen, guys. Will, any any final comments or thoughts from you? The, no, the, Lisa. Uh, owner of the show. Very interesting, as always, Lisa. And, and keep us posted on what's going on there. You're doing a great job up there. Well, thank you. Absolutely. And I love being on the show because I I broaden my knowledge base every time. And uh, just learn a lot more. Well, that's what we're all about. We're trying to bring factual, accurate information on the topic. Um, you got any- please do see if you can get a hold of your friend, uh, the guy down in oh, the yeah, panhandle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love to hear from him. And uh, yeah. folks, thank you for tuning in for this week's show. We hope this was entertaining and educational. That's our objective. So, and one final thought is if you got questions for us or if you got an encounter or just uh, want to get a hold of us, questions at creekdevil.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And also if you'd like to sit in on the campfire talk sessions. Yes, be sure to include your contact information, and uh, we'll give you a call and do a pre-interview. So excellent, folks. Will, anything else? Nope, that's it. Thanks for sitting in, everyone. Join us next time. Thanks. Thank you for the invite. Always a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open.